There was never more riding on the conclusion of a game than Halo 3. Halo Combat Evolved modernized first-person shooters on console, causing an entire generation of players to fall in love with its world and lore. Halo 2 evolved the storytelling of the franchise. It established complex characters like the Arbiter and refined the Covenant into compelling antagonists. However, Halo 2 also ended the series on an infamous cliffhanger. It's a brilliantly told story, but one that felt abrupt in its conclusion. Halo 3 needed to finish the story that Halo 2 started. If Halo 3 failed to deliver, it would not only make Halo 3 an unsatisfying game, but it would retroactively make Halo 2 a worse game. In a story, the journey matters more than the destination. Yet at the same time, the destination does matter. Think of Halo 2 as a nicely paved road. Halo 3 determined if that road led to a gold mine or a barren wasteland. Even if the road is paved with gold, knowing where it leads definitely impacts what you think about it. All of that said, Halo 3 had a great burden on its shoulders, perhaps in some ways an impossible one. Yet, Master Chief is known for nothing if not achieving the impossible. So I'm going to take a look back on the story of Halo 3 and see if it ended the series on the high note it deserved. I'm interested in more than just script writing. I think gameplay, set pieces, and environmental storytelling are incredibly important parts of how games tell their stories and how the player experiences them. So I'll be taking all these elements into account. If it's not obvious, there will be spoilers for all three of the original Halo games, so here's your warning. Let's journey into the howling dark once more. First, I want to quickly recap the cliffhangers of Halo 2, since they're important to Halo 3. They're the loose ends that Halo 3, first and foremost, has to tie up. If you're familiar with Halo 2, or you just watched my last video, I left a timestamp to skip this part. Humanity has stopped the Covenant from detonating a Halo Ring, a massive weapon designed to starve the ravenous flood by killing their food supply. They were helped by the Arbiter, a former Covenant zealot turned ally. However, the danger isn't anywhere near over. The High Prophet of Truth, the Covenant's last remaining High Prophet, has arrived at Earth in a Forerunner Dreadnought, with a fleet of Covenant ships joining him. His goal, first and foremost, is to find a Forerunner artifact that another one of the Prophet's regret has uncovered. His secondary goal is destroying humanity and with the massive force he has at his disposal, along with humanity's dwindling resources, he has a real good shot at it. Along with this fleet, he's unknowingly brought along another passenger, our hero Master Chief. He's alerted Lord Hood of his arrival, and he plans on finishing this fight once and for all. During the prior conflict, he left behind Cortana, his AI companion. She's in the clutches of the Gravemind, the Flood Infestation's greater intellect which has overtaken the Covenant's chief ship city, High Charity. The Flood has no intention of stopping its spread. So the Covenant are bearing down on Earth. The Flood is growing in power. Things get even worse from here. The deactivation of the Halo Ring kickstarted a failsafe protocol. All of the other Halo Rings are on remote activation mode, able to be fired at once from the Ark, which is exactly where the Covenant are hoping to access via the Forerunner artifact on Earth. There are a lot of plates spinning in the air by Halo 2's conclusion. You can see the large responsibility on Halo 3's shoulders to wrap up all these plot points satisfyingly. Let's see how it did. In light of how massive Halo 2's cliffhanger was, Halo 3 starts off slowly. We're greeted with a starry night sky and with Cortana's gentle narration. Cortana reflects on why she chose Master Chief out of all the Spartans she could have chosen to work with. I did my research, watched as you became the soldier we needed you to be. Like the others, you were strong and swift and brave, a natural leader. But you had something they didn't, something no one saw but me. Can you guess? Luck. This opening dialogue really works for me. The luck line shows Cartana's wry, clever sense of humor. It subverts your expectations. You expect her to say some personality trait of Chief instead of just luck. This line speaks to the greater human covenant war. Throughout the series, we witness the deaths of not only the big characters like Captain Keys, but also the countless soldiers that have joined Chief in battle but failed to make it to the other side. Despite all of his skills, 
Chief could easily be another soldier in the ground from a stray grenade, bullet, or whatever else. This line highlights the chaos inherent in war. There is a great fiery ball in the air. A smaller object splits off of it and plummets to the earth in a fiery haze. This is our hero Master Chief, arriving back on earth with quite the bang. Morning comes. Johnson and his soldiers stand over the unconscious Chief. His condition doesn't look good. Right when they think he's lost, Chief rallies. Chief, indeed, could have landed on something harder than dirt. He was one unlucky boulder away from getting crushed on impact. Cortana's words ring true. Chief's luck saved him once more. Johnson asks where Cortana is. Chief remembers her last words to him. Don't make a girl a promise that you can't keep. There's a lot of good subtext here. We understand Chief's motivations and desires in not a lot of time. He wants to rescue Cortana and keep his word. When staring at the drive, Chief is entirely absorbed by it, even with Johnson's goofy expression entering his view. You can tell that this mission is personal to him, more than his stoic and gruff demeanor would otherwise indicate. Cortana means a lot to him. Chief detects an elite, skulking in the shadows. He charges and puts his pistol right into the Arbiter's mandible. Despite the changing alliances, these two still don't have much fondness for each other. Nonetheless, the Arbiter and the Chief are both mission first sorts of guys. They put aside any personal feelings and proceed. With that, the gameplay of Halo 3 begins. Chief makes his way through the jungle with the Arbiter and Johnson's men. It's not long before they run into Covenant troops and have to fight their way forward. In a lot of ways, this introduction mission feels familiar. You're taking down small packs of Covenant with a classic band of Marines at your side. However, in a lot of ways it feels different. First off, the Elites in the Covenant's ranks are replaced by Brutes. They're not as agile as the Elites, but they're tankier with wider frames and an array of explosive weaponry. The mission showcases not only the gameplay differences between the Elites and Brutes, but also their personality differences. We see the Brutes brutalizing human soldiers in a way that the Elites just wouldn't. The Elites had a hatred and disdain for humans, but there is also refined quality to them. They were religious zealots on a holy mission and they saw honor and duty in their role. The Brutes are, as the name suggests, brutish. Although they are also zealots, they prize strength and dominance. Body language is used to great effect to communicate this. The Arbiter being at your side also gives Halo 3 a distinct flavor. During gameplay, he's immune to death, unlike most of your Marine allies. Aside from obvious narrative reasons of why he can't die during gameplay, it has the effect of making him feel more capable in combat than your other allies an elite soldier as it were. In that way, the gameplay nicely highlights the Arbiter's capabilities. You feel the lack of Cortana in this mission. In the prior two games, she's often talking into your ears you're traversing levels. This absence puts you in Chief's shoes. You miss Cortana as he does. We do get some appearances of Cortana, namely in these sporadic telepathic communications with Chief, where his movement speed slows and his vision dims. Could you sacrifice me to complete your mission? Could you watch me die? She asks him if he'd be able to sacrifice her for his mission. This underscores what I was talking about earlier. Cortana is Chief's closest friend. Rescuing her is more than just an operation for him. This first mission also breaks the serious tradition of starting Chief on a human ship. The change in initial setting does a lot to make Halo 3 feel different. All in all, Halo 3's first level finds a balance between feeling like a familiar classic Halo while also communicating the narrative changes from the prior game. Johnson splits his forces with Chief and Arbiter heading one way while he leads his men in the other. This doesn't go so well and Johnson is captured. Here, we see some more great storytelling via body language. A brute chieftain multiple times Johnson's size tries throwing him into a cell, and Johnson defiantly fights back even though it is futile. We see Johnson's stubbornness and feistiness in full display. Chief and Arbiter go to spring him. Here we see again how enemy design is used as a storytelling mechanism to characterize the brutes. The brute chieftain is heavily armored and wields a giant gravity hammer. He lurks in the back of the pack however and doesn't attack. Instead, he watches his underlings battle. Only once they are defeated, or if he is provoked earlier by Chief, does he charge into the fray to fight him in one versus one combat. 
It shows the warrior king of the hill mentality that the brutes have. Chief busts Johnson out and they evac to reconvene with the United Nations Space Corps, the UNSC, in an underground base. Soldiers watch Master Chief's arrival in awe. It shows how Chief not only brings operational success to humanity, but also hope. The Marines are all injured, highlighting the toll this war is taking and just how grueling it's been. Chief meets with Commander Keyes, who gives a nice rundown of the situation. Truth decided to land in the ruins of New Mombasa. He believes that this is where the Ark is located. If he finds it, he can detonate all of the Halo Rings, destroying all life in the galaxy and igniting the Covenant's great journey. Lord Hood hops onto a call with them and they discuss humanity's plan to stop Truth. They only have a few ships remaining, so they have to be precise. They need to punch a hole in Truth's defenses and go for the jugular. The call cuts out and the entire room goes dark. Truth himself infiltrates their comms and broadcasts a message to humanity. The culmination of our journey for your destruction is the will of the gods. And I, I am their instrument. Cocky bastard just loves to run his mouth. Truth's line is pretty dang cool, I have to say. And Johnson follows it up with his trademark snark. Unfortunately, these good lines are followed by one of the worst lines in the entire trilogy. Wounded. We're getting all of them out. I have to carry them myself. Ma'am, squad leaders are requesting a rally point. Where should they go? To war. Key's line here is just nonsensical. The officer is asking a very important question. A Covenant attack is imminent, and his men need to know a rally point. Key's line is not only corny, but it's completely counterproductive. The answer to war doesn't help anybody, and by delaying a real answer when an attack is inbound, she's putting her men's lives at risk. It completely undercuts the tension, because it seems like even Keyes isn't taking the situation seriously. But it gets even worse. Keyes is walking up the stairs, and she cocks her gun dramatically. When the cutscene ends, she pivots and heads back down the stairs unceremoniously. What is even going on? This feels like some glitch in the Matrix. It's not that big of a deal. It's one of those things where you roll your eyes and carry on with your day. However, it speaks to a somewhat looseness with the characters and story that I'll highlight as the video continues on. With the Covenant attack imminent, Chief is tasked with defending the base. This mission does a great job of furthering your bond with the Marines. Your marine allies have a lot of personality, with many humorous moments that go pretty far to humanize them. Hey, open up! Password, please! You gotta be kidding me! What password? The password so we don't open the door for brutes! Do I sound like a brute to you? Well, you could be held prisoner by brutes. If I was held prisoner by brutes and knew the password, then the brutes could just force me to tell you the password and you'd open the door for them. Okay, well now I'm definitely not gonna open the door. But we need ammo! Well, why don't you go ask your brute buddies then? The levity contrasts starkly with the peril of the situation. Humanity has been decimated and enemies are at their door. The effects of this conflict are seen throughout the level. Injured and dead marines litter the hallways, making you always aware of the losses that have been inflicted. And yet the marines still have a gung-ho attitude and no shortage of grit. It's this positivity in light of darkness that makes the marines easy to root for. You resonate with their resoluteness and persistence. Your ability to attach to the Marines increases your investment in the greater war, and therefore the greater story. I think Halo 3's ability to instill a sense of camaraderie is one of its greatest storytelling strengths, and we'll see more of it throughout the game. The Arbiter also gets some more characterization. He pleads with his enemies to rebel against the Prophets, as he's doing. There's a desperation and a frustration in his voice. Reject their lies! Rebel, or all your hides will perish. It makes you stop and think about how difficult this must be for him. He's gone from being a zealot to fighting against the very structure and people he once held dear. This isn't overstated, which I actually think makes it work better. It feels genuine. There are a handful more Cortana moments throughout this level. They're short and allude to Chief's past. None of these moments come across as all that effective to me. The fact that they slow down your movement is irritating. I ended up feeling slightly annoyed towards Cortana because of them, which I think is the opposite of what is intended. Commander Keyes decides that the base can't be held, so she orders a bomb placed in the Ops Center. The Covenant get there, however, and deactivate the bomb. 
Keyes orders Cheap to rearm the bomb. Once he does so, he has to get out of the base before detonation. He is not the only one, however. He follows a horde of Covenant as they panic and scramble out of the base. It's another case of using the sandbox and enemy behavior as a storytelling mechanism. The Covenant here have a clear sense of self-preservation. It makes them feel like actual sentient beings rather than just avatars of destruction. The willingness of Halo 3 to display its factions in multiple lights is one of its great strengths. We see the Marines with their despair and also hope. We see the Covenant as an existential threat, yet also a force made up of individuals just like the humans. It all serves to immerse the player in this world. Chief makes it to an elevator shaft, but the detonation sends it into freefall. He crashes into a garage where he regroups with some marines. He leads the marines onto the Salvo Highway, where they fight through more Covenant forces. This level is definitely focused on action, and I don't feel like there's as much to say about the story, however there are still a few things I want to point out. Salvo Highway delivers a greater sense of scale than what we've seen in the prior two levels. The vehicular combat and heavy Covenant outposts deliver the sense of warfare and open conflict and this building of scale matches the rising narrative, and this scale continues to grow. Master Chief faces down this greater battle once more with his marines, furthering your bond with them. There are also small storytelling flourishes. We get more truth dialogue via holograms placed on enemy encampments. We have seen these holograms in prior games. The fact that the Coven has their very profits on broadcast at their bases speaks to their fierce devotion. In addition, I like to think it points to the Prophet's insecurity as well, where they have to be whispering in their followers' ears at all times. Once Chief and his marines fight across the highway, the next level begins, the storm. This is one of my favorite levels in the series. We've been witnessing a building scale in the battles, from small squad fighting to vehicular fighting. And at the same time, there's been a steady focus on camaraderie. Both of these culminate in the storm. This level is the great push in the mission as they battle through the Covenant defenses to take down their air defenses and give Lord Hood's air forces an opportunity to strike at truth. This level is just epic, with Chief storming ahead with his fellow Marines at his side. The sky is flooded with Covenant Banshees, and an ominous cloud formation hangs overhead, with its center over Truth's artifact, a constant reminder of what's at stake if he succeeds. The stakes are not only visual and cinematic, this epicness translates to gameplay, with Chief having to engage in combined arms warfare against infantry and armor. This all climaxes in a battle with a scarab, a massive covenant weapon. Unlike this enemy's appearance in Halo 2, the Halo 3 version isn't heavily scripted. The scarab is a fully fledged enemy with its own artificial intelligence. Chief has to find a way to topple the behemoth, and there are multiple ways he can go about it. He can ride an elevator and drop down under the scarab from above, taking a risky jump for a potentially faster takedown. Alternatively, he can stay far away from the Scarab, firing mortar blast at it until the Scarab is grounded. He can take a Warthog or another vehicle and attack from under its legs too. There are probably even more methods I haven't thought of. The moral of the story is, the Scarab fight is incredibly dynamic. You feel like you truly took down this opponent, using your own ingenuity and skill, rather than the game just handing you a win. You earn this moment, and it makes the fight feel both incredibly memorable and cinematic. Once the Scarab goes down, Chief continues fighting with the Marines and the Arbiter, ultimately accomplishing their mission and taking down the Covenant's anti-air defenses. Lord Hood's ships attack, but they ultimately fail to stop Truth, and he manages to activate the artifact. It doesn't set off the rings though, instead it opens a giant portal orb, which Truth and the Covenant fly through. Things get worse. Another ship arrives, but is not carrying more Covenant troops, at least not living ones. The Flood, the devastating, unrelenting alien infection, has crash-landed on Earth. With that, the mission is complete. This puts us close to halfway through Halo 3's story. Up to this point, Halo 3's method of storytelling has differed greatly from Halo 2. I would call Halo 3's storytelling through these first handful of missions very objective-focused. This story is largely driven by the tasks that Chief has to complete, whether it be saving Johnson, defending the base, or taking down Covenant anti-air. Although there is some character in world building, which I pointed out throughout the video, there is less of a focus on them than in Halo 2. Halo 2 in contrast had a great degree of focus on characters. This is more heavily weighed on the Covenant side, but nonetheless there is a focus on fleshing out the Arbiter as a character, and even truth to a certain extent. World building too was a large focus, 
as we learned a ton about the covenant's inner workings. Even in the human sections, we were seeing Earth for the first time, which did a lot to help us picture human society in this universe. You could argue that the opening levels of Halo Combat Evolved had a similarly mission-driven plot, with Chief tasked with escaping the Pillar of Autumn or rescuing Marines. However, I think CE's story had an overarching sense of discovery and mystery that powered the plot past just these objectives. In Halo 3, we don't really get any new insights about any of the characters old or new. Likewise, we don't learn much about the world. We're back on Earth, a place that we've already been. There just isn't quite that sense of mystery or discovery. Despite the absence of the character or world building, I think Halo 3's narrative is still engaging for two reasons. First, I think Halo 3 does an excellent job of building your camaraderie with the Marines, which makes you feel more invested in each battle and the overall war, which I've been talking about. The second reason though is that Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2 already laid the groundwork. The world was so captivating in the prior games that it continues to be captivating in the third installment, even if Halo 3 isn't doing a whole lot of work to make it so. Same goes for the characters. We've already built an investment into characters like the Arbiter, Johnson, Chief, and Cortana, and that naturally carries on to the third game. But still, even if Halo 3 is engaging, I can't shake the feeling that it feels, at least a little bit, like Halo 3 is coasting off the momentum built up by its predecessors, and that makes it ring just a bit hollow at times. However, the return of the Flood marks a turning point in the game. There's a lot more focus on the narrative from here on out, so let's see what Halo 3 does with its characters. Along with doing YouTube, I'm also a science fiction writer. My main series is the Northfield Saga, a post-apocalyptic journey focused on Mark Northfield. He's a guy that wants to do good, but he finds it increasingly hard as the world around him bays in blood and turmoil. The third book in the series just came out, and I'm really proud of it. But don't just take my word for it. I'll read a couple excerpts I've gotten from readers' favorite. Pashako Deka writes, From the beginning, the narrative hooks you in, and it's a nonstop thrill ride from here on out. Fisher has built a believable post-apocalyptic world that feels immersive and refreshingly unique. The setting exudes a dark, foreboding atmosphere with a narrative soaked in tension, suspense, and intrigue. A CN Asian writes, General Arklin may come across as the perfect villain, but the way that the author shows what drives him in his conversation with Sloane changes your initial ideas about the man. The battle sequences are vivid, as Fisher approaches every skirmish from a technical point of view, using language that completely immerses the reader in this fast-paced novel. If you'd like to support me further, I'd love if you could check out my series and even leave a review of your own. I have a dream that the series will reach the bestseller list one day. Thanks for listening. Now back to the video. Halo 3's next level floodgate sets a dark and foreboding mood. The sky's ashen and sickly looking, as if the very clouds were infected by the flood. Chief's mission is to stop the flood from spreading by reaching the crashed flood ship and overloading its engine. They need to destroy the entire city or risk the flood taking the entire planet, in the same way a surgeon might need to amputate an arm to save the body. Chief pushes deeper into the facility on his way to the engine. There's a building sense of tension and dread as Chief overhears Marines in distress and hears the guttural roar of flood forms. Halo 3 makes the wise choice of not overplaying this tension. The tension is just enough to make the player dread the Flood's appearance, especially if they played the prior two games. However, seeing that this is the Flood's third appearance, any longer stretching attention would feel overly protracted. What follows is a grueling battle through the facility, as Chief pushes against the seemingly endless horde. Along the way, he passes scores of marine bodies, along with marines traumatized from the whole ordeal. I can see it crawling! Sliding around beneath their skin! Oh. Arbiter and Chief meet up with a squad of elites, only to learn that the elites aren't exactly having a great time either. High Charity, the Covenant City, has been reduced to a flood wasteland, and the elite's fleet of hundreds has been nearly annihilated from the infection. Not good. The elites join Chief and Arbiter in the advance to the flood ship. This is one of the coolest moments in the series to me. The elites have been an absolute menace to Chief, and by extension the player, during an entire time in the Halo series, being the most prominent and toughest of the General Covenant army. Getting to fight alongside them now is cathartic to say the least, 
and it is a good gameplay reflection of just how far the story has come since the days of combat evolved. This level is a great counter to the flat, mission-focused storytelling I've been talking about. Floodgate has a very clear objective for Chief as well, but the heavy emphasis on atmosphere makes that goal resonate with me more. Chief wants to detonate the engine, but I do personally as well to get rid of the flood and end this nightmare. As Chief enters the ship, Gravemind interrupts with grand abstract language, slowing your movement and dimming your vision. There are more of these moments throughout the game. When you pair them with the similar Cortana moments, that makes for a heck of a lot of interruptions throughout the game. Their overuse really takes you out of the game, and as it progresses, it becomes harder and harder to not just tune them out and wait for them to end, especially since Cortana and Gravemind are so vague when they speak. Chief finds Cortana and she's in rough shape. Then a familiar face arrives on the scene. It's 343 Guilty Spark, the monitor who's been a thorn in Chief and pretty much everyone's side. His primary goal was to stop the flood infestation, even if it meant killing sentient life. However, he now tells Chief that the destruction of the ring gives him no function except one, to help the Reclaimer, Chief. On Halo, you tried to kill Cortana. You tried to kill me. Protocol dictated my response. She had the activation index, and you were going to destroy my installation. You did destroy my installation. Now I have only one function, to help you, Reclaimer, as I always should have done. The as I always should have done line hits at a certain level of regret. 343 seems genuine. That's all well and good, but I don't trust this guy as far as I can throw him. He has a nasty habit of betraying people. Chief reluctantly accepts his help, despite his past. He doesn't give an explicit reason why, but it's implied it's because 343 wants to help Cortana. Chief lets his guard down when it comes to saving her, ever so slightly, and he's very protective of her. They ascend to an elite carrier. Aboard, they meet the Arbiter, the Elite Shipmaster, and Humanity's leadership. 343 manages to revive Cortana, only to discover that it's not really Cortana. This is just a message that she left for him. Cortana reveals that, on the other side of the portal Truth wormed through, there's a means to stop the Flood without detonating the Halo Rings. That's great, but they can't get any more info from her. She succumbs to pain and the message ends. The humans and elites deliberate what to do. Despite humans and elites now being allies, we see the distrust between them after years of conflict. And you, shipmaster, just glassed half a continent. Maybe the flood isn't all I should be worried about. One single flood spore can destroy a species. Were it not for the Arbiter's Council, I would have glassed your entire planet. Sir, with respect. It's not just distrust either. There's a clear disdain in the elite shipmaster's voice, and he talks down to the humans. His contempt for the species has not gone away, which feels very realistic. Another detail is that this shipmaster is actually the same Spec Ops commander from Halo 2. It's not expressively pointed out, but you can tell by the distinct wounded mandibles on his face. That itself tells a story. The commander has risen through the ranks fast, in light of the elite losses in the war, as well as his demonstrated leadership in the prior game. Lord Hood too has an attitude of distrust. He questions the elite shipmaster's glassing of half a continent to contain the flood, and questions his intentions. Commander Keys reminds them of the portal and Cortana's message. Lord Hood points out that because Cortana is damaged, the intel may be compromised as well. He would prefer to remain on Earth and take their chances with a final stand. He asks if Chief trusts Cortana enough. Chief gives his fastest response in the game. Earth is all we have left. You trust Cortana that much? Sir. Yes, sir. There's also a lot of passion in his voice, far more than Chief normally has. This scene is great, and it's working on multiple levels at once. The plot advances, as Lord Hood agrees to head through the portal to look for Cortana's solution. Yet at the same time, there's world building here. We're learning more of the relationship between the elites and humans post-conflict, and their attitudes towards each other. We also have subtle characterization of Chief Hood and the Commander. This ability to operate on multiple levels makes this cutscene very engaging, and when you rewatch it, you can pick up on new things. It's very reminiscent of Halo 2 and how it delivered cutscenes. The UNSC and Elite Fleet go through the portal and arrive on a massive Forerunner installation that mostly consists of desert. 
Chief sets out with some ODST soldiers to find Cortana's solution. We're treated to one of the most breathtaking skyboxes in the game, as we see the Milky Way. It inspires a sense of awe and mystery, much like Halo Combat Evolved. Chief and the UNSC continue on, and this is another camaraderie building level. You fight with fellow troopers in infantry and vehicular combat. The UNSC soldiers, as always, are brimming with personality. Tank beats ghost! Tank beats hunter! Tank beats everything! This, for me, culminated with Chief had to navigate through an open battlefield, filled with enemy vehicles, which ends in another scarab battle. It was me as Chief in a warthog with one marine, who manned a Gauss cannon. As I drove, this loyal marine would reliably take down Covenant vehicles and troops who got in our way. And yet, despite his steadfast service, there were so many enemy vehicles that I died a lot, more than anywhere else in the game. And each time I respawned, this loyal marine spawned at my side and we took on the challenge again and again. He would shout at the Covenant and give me heads up. Eventually, we managed to take the Scarab down to its knees, and I had to leave the Warthog to destroy the Scarab for good. I noticed that the Marine's getting shot, but he remains loyally in position, firing on enemies. Once the Scarab blows up, my first thought, I kid you not, was realizing that my Marine had still been nearby. The first thing I did was try to find the Warthog. I discover it, but there's no Marine in sight. I turn and I find the marine's body against the wall. He had been blasted out of the gunner seat and killed. And I actually felt bummed about this. This guy and I had been through the ringer during this level, and I wanted him to make it on the other side with me. It's not many games that make you care about a random soldier, which the developers aren't particularly trying to make you care about. It's a testament to the dynamic storytelling of Halo 3 Sandbox, and how that dynamic storytelling deepens your connection with your allies and intensifies your disdain for the enemy. Chief continues on, along with the surviving UNSC soldiers and the Arbiter. They reach the cartographer, and Guilty Spark investigates further. Guilty Spark discovers that this installation is, in fact, the very arc that Truth had been searching for. Truth has triggered a defensive barrier around the arc's core. Chief and the Arbiter need to stop him, but before they can, more Covenant arrive on the scene. There's a cool segment here where a brute chieftain waits in the center of a ring with brutes surrounding him. The outer brutes will let you fight 1v1 with the brute chieftain, only stepping in if you attack them, or when the chieftain is defeated. It's a really cool way of using gameplay to further characterize the brutes, and you get a sense for the importance of hierarchy and physical dominance in their ranks. Chief and company are ready to set out, but they witness a swarm of sentinels moving. 343 wants to investigate further, but Commander Keys decides it can wait. They need to stop truth. Before that, nothing else matters. As the next level, the Covenant begins, Chief storms a beach along with ODST soldiers. It's very reminiscent of the Halo CE mission, The Silent Cartographer, and it gives you this full circle feeling. It feels right, once again storming the beaches with your comrades. There's a heavy focus on combat as Chief fights his way up towers and disables them. At the top of each, a brute chieftain awaits, who will once more wait until Chief beats his underlings before going on the offensive. Unfortunately, things go a bit south. Johnson's assault on the third power failed, and he was taken prisoner. Johnson needs to be saved, but first, Chief has to deactivate the final tower to lower the barrier. Stopping Truth, after all, has to be their number one priority. Chief succeeds in his mission, but any jubilation is quickly undercut by the flood-infected High Charity's arrival. This mirrors the Flood's arrival in the storm, which also undercut Chief's success of disabling AA cannons. The guy can't just get a clean win, can he? The Flood don't stop the Chief, the Elites, or the UNSC from continuing their offensive. This culminates in a fight against not one, but two Scarabs. It's easily the highest scale battle in the series up until this point. There are so many ways to take down the two Scarabs, and it's another great example of the story-generating design of Halo 3 Sandbox. Once the Scarabs are down, the Chief and Arbiter head into the Citadel, where Truth is planning on firing the rings. He is trying to force Johnson to activate it. Why does he need Johnson to do it? Well, we'll get to that later. Chief and the Arbiter aren't going to reach Truth in time. Then, Commander Miranda Keys crashes into the Citadel via a pelican. She does her best to stop Truth, but she ultimately dies in the attempt. Another one of our allies, one in a long line, has fallen. Unfortunately, this scene just doesn't work for me, and it's a shame, because I really like Miranda Keys. Less so in Halo 3 than 2, but still. 
The fact that this scene made me feel apathy, I think, is due to how the scene is handled rather than her as a character. I mean, I felt bad earlier for a random Marine. So why does this scene not land? Well, it's because Miranda's actions come across as pretty brain dead here. She decides to bolt in by herself against a bunch of brutes, and well, that goes exactly how you would expect. Chief and the Arbiter were literally in the same building. Why didn't she at least pick them up along the way? I know they didn't have much time, but it's hard for me to imagine that she couldn't have figured out a way to uber them up without losing much time. Maybe you really can't argue that she just had no time to do anything different. But I don't know. It just feels very contrived to have allies literally in the same building, and her in a ship, but having to end up fighting alone. And the way she just stands around firing her shotgun, it just feels so bereft of the desperation the situation calls for. And this situation is so unwinnable. Why doesn't she kill Johnson and herself so the Covenant can't use them? Maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I'm pretty sure they need a live human to activate the Ark. Otherwise, Truth could have just killed Johnson already, or he could have just picked up a random dead human soldier. I guess all in all, Keyes has always been presented as a smart tactical woman. Even if all these events line up logically, it still feels like she could have figured out a better plan than this. When she dies, you're left wondering why she acted like this, and it completely takes you out of mourning her death, which is what you should be focused on. The worst part is she ultimately fails. Johnson is still in Truth's clutches, so it feels pointless. Chief and Arbiter have to stop Truth. They're aided by the Grave Mind, whose objective is, for now, aligned with theirs. After all, the true purpose of the Halo Rings is to stop him. This feels like a reunion from the second game, where the trio also work together to stop a ring's detonation. There's an awesome gameplay segment where you fight with the Flood. The Covenant react in absolute terror as you and a gang of parasite monsters push forward. Just like when you teamed up with the Elites, this is a cathartic feeling. They reach Truth, and the Arbiter gets an awesome final scene with him, where he delivers an absolute winner line. Be silenced. The Arbiter's scream too is telling. Even though Truth needed to face justice, the Arbiter had such fervent faith in the Prophets once. This serves as his final severance from the Covenant, and the separation from something he once held dear is still painful. With Truth's death, I want to reflect a bit on his character. In Halo 3, his goals are to destroy humanity and activate the Halo Rings, but there really isn't much more to him than that. I think he's a lot less complex and a lot less interesting than in his Halo 2 days, where he felt a lot more calculated and subtle in his approach. This is because he also had the other prophets as equals, so he had to appease them while subtly machinating against them. The lack of these same side rivals means that in Halo 3, he doesn't really have anyone interesting to bounce off of and showcase his character. He comes across as more of a standard blank evil villain here. Arbiter has some great character moments in Halo 3, the best of them being this scene in my opinion. However, with how big of a role he played in Halo 2, I wish he had got more time to shine in this game. He definitely feels like he's been put in the back seat when he was a protagonist in the last game. I'm not necessarily saying he should have been a protagonist in 3 as well, but I still think there is more meat on the bone to explore with him, which feels left on the table. With the Covenant defeated, the Grave Mind no longer has a shared goal with Chief or the Arbiter, so he abruptly turns against them. Chief and Arbiter make their desperate escape, jumping down a chute. Upon landing, Chief follows a hologram of Cortana. A new Halo Ring is revealed, one that serves as a replacement for the ring Chief destroyed. Chief, Arbiter, and 343 make the connection. This ring is the solution that Cortana had discovered. They can use a tactical pulse to destroy the local flood infestation while leaving the rest of the galaxy intact. However, he must retrieve the activation index to fire it off. He has to the flood infected High Charity, the ship that Cortana is imprisoned in, and the very same one that brought the flood to the Ark. In this level, Chief has to fight through the most infested hive of flood forms. 
The cramped, narrow corridors paired with the aggressive enemies makes this level both intense and claustrophobic. As soon as you start the level, you want to get out of it, which I think is effective storytelling. This is the heart of the flood. We should want to get out of here. However, Chief also has to endure a significant number of Gravemind and Cortana interruptions. The screen dims and Chief's movement is slowed to a halt. Unfortunately, these interruptions don't land any better than any time previously in the game, and they're even worse due to their frequency. The Cortana interruptions make me reflect on how I miss Cortana throughout the game. In the prior games, she was always at Chief's side. Their dynamic together in dialogue, mostly one way from Cortana, was something I appreciated. Her absence throughout the game is truly felt. I think it's a shame that we don't reunite with her until the penultimate chapter in the game. I will say though that their reunion is cathartic when it happens. I love the subtle characterization of Chief in this exchange. Around Cortana, he's more verbose than with anyone else, and there's more comfort in his voice. You can really feel that special connection he has with her. Chief and Cortana make their escape. The claustrophobia works to great effect here, and the intensity is ratcheted up. The player desperately wants to get out of this place, as does Chief. Once they've escaped, they head to the ring. He is joined by the Arbiter. Even though the other elites are ready to leave, along with the humans, the Arbiter stays with Chief to finish the fight. I'd like to contrast this with the beginning of the game, when Chief stuffed a pistol in Arbiter's face. Now the two of them are going to end this together. Although this is a big difference, it comes across as very natural and I didn't think twice about it. When it comes to their relationship, the Arbiter and Chief don't get a whole lot of explicit development as far as dialogue or cutscenes go. However, throughout the game you have fought dozens of battles with him at your side. I think it's a testament to how Halo 3's dynamic gameplay storytelling works for the Arbiter too. By fighting through so many battles with him, you get the sense that the Arbiter and Chief now trust each other more, even without that dialogue or cutscenes. They're both men of action, so having their relationship primarily forged through battle feels right. It's a good use of show rather than tell, for lack of a better term. Johnson is headed to the ring too, and he intends on landing near the control room. They land on the ring. Cortana mentions that the ring is so new that she's not sure exactly what will happen when they fire it off. Chief responds very simply. Halo, it's so new, unfinished. I'm not exactly sure what will happen when we fire it. We'll head for the portal. There's just a steadiness and sure-footedness to the Master Chief which makes him really appealing. You can see why the Marines are so inspired by him. Chief and Arbiter fight through an intense cluster of flood forms, but they manage to clear an LZ for Johnson. It feels fitting for him to be here. He was one of the first humans to discover the flood at the Halo installation after all, and he deserves to be the one to end it. They head into the control room. 343 Guilty Spark explains that the installation will be ready in a few days. Obviously, that's not a convenient timetable for humanity, so Johnson plans to fire it off anyway. Premature firing of the ring will destroy the Ark, and 343 will not allow that. He blasts Johnson with the laser, wounding him, and then he turns his sights on Chief. In a very predictable manner, he betrays Chief again. Maybe he'll learn to stop trusting someone with the word guilty in his name. Then 343 drops a big reveal. You are the child of my makers! Inheritor of all they left behind. You are Forerunner. The Forerunners we've heard so much about are actually the ancestors of humans. A lot of the oddities and hints we've seen throughout the series all make sense. Like earlier in the game when Truth had to use Johnson's hand to activate Forerunner technology. Another example of 343 referring to Chief as Reclaimer. Well, if he's the descendant of Forerunners, it makes sense he's reclaiming what they built. Even the Forerunner architecture, while it looks distinctly alien, also looks more human than what we've seen from the likes of the Covenant. It's a cool confirmation of what many savvy players had put together from all these hints throughout the series. I know that later on, this reveal gets soft retconned by a rewrite of the lore by the next Halo developers 343 Industries. However, I think the intent in this game is fairly clear. Guilty Spark literally says, you are Forerunner. I mean, I don't know how much more plainly you can state it than that, so I'm going with the original intention here. Chief takes on 343 Guilty Spark, ultimately defeating him. Johnson is mortally wounded, so this is one adventure he won't get to see the end of. 
Johnson passes away, telling Chief not to let Cortana go. This death works a lot better than Key's. Johnson's presence makes sense, and his death feels true to the character. Chief activates the ring, so he and Arbiter have to hightail it out before the ring fires. This culminates in a final race across the ring. It's a callback to the conclusion of Halo Combat Evolved. While this ending loses a few points for originality, it ultimately feels like the right gameplay send-off, giving the gameplay a full circle feeling. Chief and Arbiter make it to the hangar. Cortana and Chief share a final moment as the ring detonates. We see Chief's sure-footedness and Cortana's care for him. The screen fades to white. The epilogue follows. Lord Hood holds a ceremony for the fallen soldiers, Chief believed to be amongst them. The back half of the ship had been separated from the explosion. Afterwards, the Arbiter and Lord Hood share a moment. This is the final wrapping up of the human and Sangheli relationship. Two species once at odds now finding peace. It's soft and quiet for how large of a scale the war had been, but it feels right. It feels genuine. The Arbiter heads back to his home world with the other Sangheli. One final scene remains, Chief and Cortana. They are alone in a vast stretch of space with only each other for company. Chief isn't very disturbed by this. He heads to cryosleep, entering the same state that he woke in the first game. Again, this feels very full circle. Chief returning to sleep after doing his duty feels like the perfect capstone to his character. Once that duty is complete, he patiently awaits the next task. Cortana says she'll miss him. It's a final reflection of what they've meant to each other during the battle. Chief tells her to wake him when she needs him. With that, Halo 3 and the Halo trilogy as a whole come to an end. Just like the game, I'll bring the video full circle too. Was Halo 3 a worthy conclusion to the trilogy? Halo 3 had to end the series in a satisfying way, one that successfully wrapped up the plotline set up by the prior games. I think in terms of that goal, Halo 3 succeeds. The conclusion to the Human Covenant War and the Flood Threat ends in a very satisfying way. The Arbiter gets his justice against truth, and there is the climactic reveal of humanity's relationship with the Forerunners. There are some odd and inconsistent moments, like with Commander Keys a few times, but these can mostly be shrugged off and ignored as blips. Halo 2 ended on an abrupt cliffhanger, and as I mentioned earlier, that made it highly dependent on how the third game turned out. Halo 3 makes Halo 2 stand taller, by concluding the series in a satisfying way. At the same time though, I think you can feel that pressure to end the series right, all throughout the game. Halo 2 took a ton of bold storytelling risks, especially with you taking the role of the Arbiter and the game's overall willingness to flesh out and characterize the Covenant. Halo 3 distinctly lacks that same boldness and risk-taking in the storytelling department. The characters are true to themselves, yet at the same time, Halo 3 doesn't go to great lengths to do anything truly interesting or innovative with them. There isn't a sense of growth with any of them, really. They're pretty much the same people at the start of the game as at the end. The story is well put together, yet I don't think it evokes quite the same wonder as the first and second game. I guess that's what I mean when I say you can feel the pressure on this game. You can almost feel a sense of fear, of taking too daring a step and ruining everything. Halo 3 is a worthy entry, more than that it's a worthy ending, doing justice to its predecessors. I think the Halo series' strongest storytelling aspect, the dynamic sandbox, even reigns supreme here. Yet at the same time, a part of me wishes for a Halo 3 that would have dared to be more than just a satisfying conclusion. I find myself wishing for the bold choices in Halo 2, and the clear vision of story you could feel in that game. But with that in mind, I'm well aware that we should be careful for what we wish for. I'm glad we got this Halo 3, and I'm glad we finished the fight. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please consider liking, subscribing, or checking out my Northfield series. Until next time.